And whenever anybody thinks of Hanford Dixon, the only pit uniform they're ever going to see him in a picture of, it's a Cleveland Browns uniform. Is this in fast forward? Because Hanford's moving at a different speed than everybody right there. Hey Browns fans, welcome in to another edition of the 75th anniversary Browns Breakdowns. And today we are joined by the top dog, Hanford Dixon, a man who manned the quarterback position for the Browns ever since he was a first round pick in 1981 for the entire decade. Three-time Pro Bowler, two-time first-team All-Pro, 26 career interceptions in the regular season, and of course, he had a playoff interception as well, and he joins me now. Hanford, you are synonymous with this organization, 75 years. Everybody knows about the dog pound. You created it. You were part of the creation of that. So when you think about the fact and the role that you played, a great decade in this great 75-year history with the Browns. Oh, I tell you what, Nathan, it was just great. I mean, I can remember going back to uh, the first day when I was, uh, when I found out I was going to be a Cleveland Browns, how excited uh, uh, I was, uh, even though, you know, I was a little bit excited about playing for the Cleveland Browns because I knew about the franchise. I knew about the history of the uh, franchise. I knew it was a very rich franchise and all the great players that have played for the Cleveland Browns in the past. But uh, one thing I wasn't looking for was the cold weather here yeah. in, uh, in, uh, in the city of uh, Cleveland. But uh, when I came here, I was coming, the football team was really on a high because, as you know, they had just lost a uh, playoff game uh, uh, in Cleveland against the Oakland Raiders. So uh, I was very excited about coming here. Sam Reticoliani, again, as you know, was the coach. Marty Scheidenheimer and Dave Adolph and all those guys were on the uh, defensive staff. But I tell you, there was a lot, a lot of talent on this football team when I came in. So I just thought uh, I could just fit right in with all those guys. You know, I know a lot of the guys we talked to who are drafted out of the South here, an Alabama kid, and they were, whoa, what am I doing going up to Cleveland and that cold and that snow? But the warmth of the city and the fans, that relationship, and I know how special that was for you and obviously Frank when you guys were out there together and you coined the dog pound. So maybe there's somebody watching this who does not know how yeah. this came to be. So let the world know how it came to be the dog pound and you, of course, the top dog. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll get in, Nate, you know, I, I felt kind of special as soon as I came. I, I, I felt a special uh, uh, roar about this uh, city and the Cleveland Browns fans when I came here. So, uh, I, again, it was very exciting to be here. But the dog pound, you know, I, it was funny because for the Browns, uh, you know, every other team, pretty much every team in the NFL, they had uh, their little thing. For instance, you had the uh, – uh, New York Jets, the Pittsburgh Steelers, uh, but the, it was just the Cleveland Browns. The Cleveland Browns didn't uh, have that, uh, that nothing. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> what I wanted to do was I wanted to give them something. So I never will forget it. Uh, we had the all-pro quarterbacks, again, myself and Frank Minifield. We had the all-pro linebackers. I talked about uh, Clay Matthews and Chip Banks, yeah. but we just didn't have those guys on that line that could really go and get it. So we were at, again, we were at Lakeland Community College and uh, me being from down south, thinking about how old dog chase a cat. And, uh, you know, told those guys, I said, hey, we're going to bark at you guys. You're talking about the defensive line. When you hear us bark, you guys rear those ears back and just think of yourself as the dogs and the quarterback as the cat. And you guys just go get them. So we were in training camp. We started barking. And uh, again, I talked about how close the fans were to the field. It wasn't like they were well distance back then. But the fans started barking. Everybody started barking. Before we know it, it wasn't just the defensive line. It was the whole defense. It was the whole team. Everybody was the dogs on the Cleveland Browns. And, man, I can't believe still today that thing is still going. And you know how Frank Minifield is. So Frank Minifield said it. He said, Hamper, we got to patent this thing. We got to get this thing going. But we went to patent it, and uh, NFL Properties already had it. <laughs> <laughs> That could have been your billion dollar. Oh, idea. yes, 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 yes. But you know, I'm happy it's still here. And and when I still go out in the city, I mean, you have fans that bark at me and I bark back at them. And again, uh, I'm just happy the players that play today, they still have this dog thing going. I see them now on the sideline. They got this big dog chain. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure I'm sure you've had that around your neck, haven't you? <laughs> no, well, I've, I've seen it. I've seen it's beautiful. <laughs> Yeah. But no, I, you got to get a turnover to get yeah. that. I, I, haven't, I haven't earned that yet. The thing, the truth is, Hanford, there's only one 
top dog. And that's yeah. you. So, I mean, I, on some level, they, they give you the risk. That's the respect. You didn't get the patent. You didn't get the billion dollars, but you hey, got the top dog name. Nathan, I'm going to tell you a funny, funny story. And, and, and I still never forget this story. When I uh, first came to uh, Cleveland, I got off a plane and, you know, I thought there were going to be like a lot of fans uh, waiting for me. And there wasn't anyone waiting for me. And I had like a little, uh, you know, a little country boy from Alabama, dirt roads, uh, a place called Theodore, Alabama. And I had on this uh, a white suit and I thought I was just really, really sharp. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, uh, and I never will forget this. Ozzy pulled me to the side. He said, boy, where are you going with that old white suit on? <laughs> I said, hey, man, you know, I got to look good. He said, if you don't go take that damn thing off, you know, I'm going to have a fit. And I never will forget that as long as I live, you know. Ozzy pulling me to the side. I said, what the, where are you going, boy, with that? with that suit on, that white suit on. It hurt my feelings because I, I look pretty good, you know? I bet you did look good. Yeah, Maybe yeah. it's just a little bit jealous, but I'm yeah. you and Ozzy. Yeah, yeah. Friends for a long time. Right. And I would say your fashion, as somebody who's gotten to work with you on yeah. Browns, your yeah. fashion's evolved nicely, Ham. Yeah. Just got, let's just say I've gotten a lot better. <laughs> I wish we had a picture of that. That would have been great. But no, no. Why don't we get into some of this film and look at what made you on the field, the legend that you are in Cleveland Browns history and let's go right where it started week seven 1982 terry bradshaw and the steelers this would be the game where you got your first career interception and not only your first career interception, you said you know what i like it so much i'm gonna get three of them in this game but here's a look at your first career interception what do you remember from this game obviously muddy but this play as you went and dove in there and said nope that's mine well, you know what, Nathan, that was one of the, uh, it all came from a preparation uh, film study. Uh, one thing that uh, I pride myself, uh, Frank and I, I'll talk about him too, we prided ourselves on was uh, being able to know what the opposing team was going to do, how they were going to attack us. And that's one thing about the Pittsburgh Steelers, pretty much knew what they, I knew what they were going to do before they even uh, did it, because you could tell how fast that uh, with Bradshaw, it was a three-step drop. And one thing you know as a cornerback, when they when there's a three-step drop, the quarterback has got to get rid of it right away. If they can't out and up you. They can't do any double moves. You, he's got to get rid of it right away. And I knew that, and that's why I was able to uh, jump in front of the wide receiver and intercept that football. And I love it afterwards. You're not sure. Was I down? Was I not? Am I supposed to celebrate? Well, yeah, Am I yeah. supposed to run? And then, well, and then you get over there. But what was that feeling like for you just to get your first career interception in the NFL and to have it come off the hands of a Steelers legend like Terry Bradshaw? Well, it was it, it, obviously uh, that was important, but it was also important because uh, it was a team in our division, uh, which was the uh, AFC uh, Central then. And uh, Nathan, uh, I, I played especially tough against those guys because I was a little bit upset with the Pittsburgh Steelers because uh, the reason why I was upset because I actually thought that I was going to be drafted by the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, rather than the Cleveland Browns because uh, they, uh, there was some talk that they were going to get me and they were going to take me. But what happened was I wanted to find out why they didn't draft me and they said uh, they thought I was a little bit too short. Uh, for their football team. So I said in my mind, every single time I play you guys, I'm going to make you pay. I'm going to play. Well, I played hard anyway, but I'm going to really play hard and make you guys understand what you lost, what you don't have now in the team in your division have a player of my caliber on their team. Well, I think you showed them. We saw the first yeah. one here. Let's go on to interception yeah. number two here on <laughs> this day because you weren't done. One was not enough. You got a second one here where Terry Bradshaw thinks he's he's running around like he thinks he's a scrambling quarterback <laughs> and all of a sudden tries to sling it again. Look at your break on the ball. You're quick. <laughs> When the ball is in the air and those diving catches, heck, you could have been a receiver with these hands, Hanford. Well, one thing about me, uh, I was always, I was not very big, Nathan, but I was always very fast. And uh, I took pride in myself in doing the agilities and the agilities, when you do those, they make you a lot quicker. And uh, I, when I came out of college, I ran like a 4-3, I think I ran a 4-3-9-40, something like that. It was pretty, uh, yeah, it, it was pretty quick. And I always had, as a corner, you ask any of the corners, they'll tell you one thing you have to be able to do, you have to be able to change directions really, really fast. And that's what I was able to do on that particular play. If you could see it, just the, just like you mentioned, just the break on that ball. And then, you know, people talked about my hands, 
They said I didn't have very good hands. But look on that play, Nathan. I mean, it looks like uh, my hands are pretty good, right? That's why we play defensive back, they say, because we don't, we can't play wide receiver because we can't catch the football. But I think my hands are okay. I've seen two diving catches yeah. contested in, in wet situations, yeah. mud everywhere. Yeah. And come on, nothing stops you. So you got two in that game. Did you, Were you even thinking at this point, maybe I'm going to go get the hat trick? You know what? I was not. I was not thinking about the hat trick. I just, uh, when there's a chance to make a play, because I didn't think, I, I thought for a minute there, even though they had the all pro wide receivers, uh, I said, well, they can't keep throwing over here. They got to be, uh, understand that this is a no throw zone. That's but, right. Uh, but being Bradshaw, being Bradshaw, and the weapons that he has on his football team, he doesn't care. He's just going to keep coming at you, keep coming at you, keep coming at you. And I said, if you keep coming, I'm going to make you pay. And I was and able to get that next one. No hands? What are you talking about, Hanford? You come diving in here out of nowhere. Look at that. <laughs> Can Good you uh, protect the ball? You cradled it underneath, made sure it was a catch. And then I like, you have a little fist bump. You're just like, that's right. Maybe. Can you imagine having to play on a field like that today? No. I mean, that's no. A, I mean, look at that field. Look at the mud. Boy, I love that. That made it tough on the wide receivers. And, and the footing of those guys. They can't go through their breaks as fast as they want to. Now, Hanford, you weren't just a cover guy as well. Sometimes you got the blitz. And in this game, first career interception and first career sack. Look out and you force the fumble. <laughs> How? What is that feeling like? Corners, you don't get to do it a ton. But when you did and you were unblocked on that one, you go in there, you get that sack. But Nathan, you know what you have to do? And I don't have to tell you this. You already know this. You have to disguise it. You can't let them know you're coming. What you have to do is you have to uh, kind of uh, know the snap and you got to stay, you, you know, you can't jump offside. And soon as you, that ball is snapped, you just got to shoot in there like a rocket. And that's what I did. Hit Bradshaw right in the back because you, you could tell he didn't see me coming because no. as a result, he fumbled the football. And boy, that was a big one. That was absolutely a big big one and I kept and everybody kept coming up to me man you are having a monster monster game just keep it up just keep it up but look at this Nathan Ooh. look at that first of all I'm, I gotta ask our video Rob is this in fast forward because Hanford's moving at a different <laughs> speed than everybody right there I mean look at this he's boom there he is look out hey, and that's in the mud too baby that's in the mud and I think that's a guy number 94 that was Elvis Franks who played defensive end who was able to pick up the fumble and there's Eddie Johnson around us. And boy, I tell you, defensively, we were really bringing it that day. Get out the way, Golick. <laughs> <laughs> Golick at the end, a victim of the pile. So we've seen you terrorize the Steelers, and we'll come back to that in a second. But what a game for you. And, and after that game, what was that like? First career interception, you end up getting three. First career sack. Were you saying, yeah, Pittsburgh, this is what you missed out on. But for the Browns, obviously, this, that was really a sign of what was to come. Well, yeah, because it, it, it meant a lot to me because obviously uh, the Cleveland Browns and Mr. Modell thought, of, thought enough of me to uh, draft me in the first round. Uh, obviously, it was the 22nd pick in the first round. And uh, I wanted to, um, every game, I wanted to let them know that the player that they decided to take with that pick was worthy of being a first round draft pick. And I was just on my way then showing them that I not only did I deserve to be a Cleveland Browns, but I deserve to be a number one draft pick. All right, we're going to fast forward to 1987, one of your Pro Bowl seasons and one of your all pro seasons and take a look at you getting another legend, Boomer Esiason. Uh-uh, don't come. No throw zone, Hanford Dixon. <laughs> no throw zone right here. This was a pretty interesting play because this was like a dig route that Boomer was throwing. And uh, But see, what Boomer didn't know, we had another linebacker right underneath the coverage, and Boomer had to put a little bit of air on that football. And as a result of him putting a little air on that football, I was able to come up with the interception. But I give a lot of credit on a lot of those interceptions to the guys, uh, our two linebackers, Clay Matthews, Chip Banks, and our defensive line, because what they did, they kept coming. And obviously, when they come, I don't care who the quarterback is, if he's a good quarterback, when he's got pressure, he'll turn into an average quarterback. And as an average quarterback, we're able to do things on the back end, come up with those interceptions, those picks, and those fumbles, and turn it into a big play. When you watch these, okay, we've seen you playing in mud. Now we're on a baseball field where you can see the patches that are covering, like, the bases. 
Can you, when you think about it now and you think about these beautiful places they play in the NFL and how manicured and well-groomed everything is and there are not the multi-purpose stadiums anymore, is it amazing to you just kind of how far the game has come? It really is amazing because uh, I remember some of the fields and uh, I'll, I'll just talk about our stadium, for instance. Uh, as you know, both we play football and they play baseball in the stadium. And a lot of times there wasn't any grass. And what, we would, what they would do is they would paint uh, the dirt green just to make it look like grass. But when you look at some of these fields today, they're manicured. They just they're absolutely gorgeous and beautiful fields. And I think they make the players a little bit faster. I mean, obviously, uh, a, a guy like myself, even with the 4-3 speed, I could have possibly, you know, been running a 4-2 on the fields they have today. But then again, you look at it, I can look at it another way. The, the receivers are going to get faster too. So I was just happy the way we played. All right, let's go take a look at one more interception, 1987. This is week 16. Again, it's the Steelers. And again, you said, nah, uh, uh, all of these dominant in the division. And here's the last one we're going to take a look at today. A little play action. They try to go vertical on the top dog. No, I don't think so. Hey, Nathan, this was a really, really good one. I, I wish we could have uh, caught some of the action in the beginning of what happened, but you could just see really was in a bump and run defense and got the jam on stalwart there and uh you could see bradshaw i don't know what he's thinking about he right now he should know not to come over here me messing with dixon too much so he got those hands up in the air caught it with my hands not with my body and i do have good hands but it was a great great pick anytime again played against those pittsburgh steelers or a team in our division came up with a big play just outstanding and I like that you did. You, you, you high pointed that ball. That's the way, that's how they teach it. That's how they <laughs> dial it up for the cornerback. So when you think about your career, obviously you were physical. You love to play press at the line of scrimmage. You had the speed so that you could mirror the routes you had. As you talked about, you worked on your agility. You were diligent in your film study. You know, when you think back on your career and, and all the work that goes into having that kind of success, is that one of the things that you think people don't really understand is what a commitment it is not only to your body but to your mind to be able to play cornerback at this level in the national football league yeah i i agree with you i, I think a lot of people think that when you play this game or, or you play football you don't have to be uh, you don't have to be smart it's just something you, you just have to have athletic ability that's not true uh you, you you have to have you have to be an athlete you have to have the ability but you also have to have the smart because you talked about it, just the hours alone that athletes put in, put into their craft, uh, just studying their opponents, just uh, because you know all the different formations that a lot of teams and their offense, things they're gonna try to do to you, think how they're gonna try to attack you. Uh, when I'm out there, when I've been out there on the field, my mind is running like a computer. Uh, if they're in this one formation, uh, if the receivers line up uh, out so many yards outside the uh, hash mark, uh, things are running through my mind, what they're going to try to do to me, how they're going to try to attack me, things that they're, I've seen in my film study that can help me anticipate what the play is going to be in order to make a big play or, or stop them from making a big play. But it, it's a lot of work that goes into it, and that's why uh, my hat's off to those guys. And your mind is still there. That's why every time we're on countdown together, you got like three plays in you. The yeah. body will give you three plays, but the mind, <laughs> yeah. the mind's still there, Hanford. Yeah, Nathan, if those three plays, though, make sure I have some cushion, baby. Make sure <laughs> I have some cushion and make sure you got a safety over top of me. That's because, right, get a safety over there. So I got to ask you this, Hanford, because you look at your career and, and what a great one it was. You were considered one of the premier lockdown corners. You and Frank, obviously one of the best tandems in the NFL. You go to the Pro Bowl three of your last four seasons. You're a first team all pro, which is, I think, the most prestigious honor you can get as a football player in a given season. When you're first team all pro, you are flat out, period, the best at what you do. You know, you're a first team all pro to those final four. And then you hung it up, still playing at a very high level. What was kind of the thought process at that time that you said, all right, here's my decade. It was as good. I'll put it up against anybody's. And then you went on to the next phase of your career and your life. Well, you know what? It, it, it was a tough decision. I mean, it was really, really tough decision because uh, you always hate to, I don't care who the player is. They always hate to give up, uh, hang up the cleat. Yeah. And with, and with me, uh, I, I, you know, I was, 
I signed a contract. I was going out to the uh, San Francisco 49ers and I was going to play with them. And uh, in training camp, uh, I tore my quad. And uh, what happened was when you tear your quad, the muscle just popped. And the only way to repair that muscle was they wanted to do it by uh, surgery. And you know what? I thought about it and I said, you know what? I played nine good years and uh, I've had a good career and I'm just done. I said, I'm just done. I've just had it. Um, you know, and I think everyone, all the players know in their mind when they want to give it up and when they've had enough. And with me, that was just enough. I just didn't want to go through a surgery to uh, repair that quad and, uh, and then go through the rehab and then try to come back. So that's what happened. And that's why I uh, called it quits. When you look back at it, are you all, uh, though young Nathan in the Bay Area, a 49ers fan would have been very happy yeah, yeah. with the 49ers. I remember yeah. when you were coming there and I was yeah. excited about it, yeah. but are you happy that you were able to, you're one of the few, you know, play, start and finish, especially in the modern era, it's very hard to do so, but that you played your entire career here with this organization. And whenever anybody thinks of Hanford Dixon, the only pit uniform they're ever going to see him in a picture of, it's a Cleveland Browns uniform. You played at such a high level. You are beloved by this town. You have made it your home. Uh, is that something that, you know, when you look back at it, is that a silver lining to it that, you know what, you never played anywhere else? It, it, it really is because these fans, uh, they love us. Uh, you know, I, we love them. I love them. Uh, always have, always will be. I mean, everybody talks about the uh, Indians. You can talk about the Cavaliers, but this is a Browns town. Uh, it always will be a Browns town and uh, the best fans anywhere, anywhere in the world. And again, I don't have to tell you, you know, this football team has been down for so long. Now we're on our way back. We got a great head, a good head coach. We have uh, a good quarterback. We have a good base nucleus of his football team. Everybody's starting to put it together. Everybody's starting to play well. And we're winning again. And the fans are excited. And I tell these guys all the time, I said, guys, you can say what you want to say. You see how when you what you when wasn't winning football games, how the fans were. Yeah. Wait, wait till you win some football games. And you're going to see they're going to get really get crazy again. Cleveland Browns fans, best fans anywhere in the world. Couldn't have said it any better. You are right. And just the way that you walk through this city, there's nowhere you could go where people, as you said, aren't barking at you. They're calling for the top dog. It is that reverence for football in this town that really makes it so special. And I mean, look, we talked about Pro Bowls. We talked about all pros. We talked about the top dog nickname and creating the dog pound. Not to mention, you got to star in a movie as well. <laughs> yeah. Part of your time here with the Cleveland Browns. You did it all, Hanford. What a great <laughs> Here uh, we yes. go, Brownies. Here we go. Woo, woo. <laughs> Hanford, this has been an absolute blast going in the film room, looking at some of your great highlights, <laughs> sharing some stories. So thank you so much for joining us on this edition of the 75th anniversary special Browns Breakdown. <laughs> <laughs>